Office and Obstetric Procedures talk about perineal laceration repair. And going on, going along like we have been, we're going to start out by by going through some of the anatomy. So the, the perineum, um, superficially, the way to define the borders of it are you can look at the ischial tuberosities here shown on the side, connect them with a line, and then you make um, two different triangles. So the anterior triangle is called the urogenital triangle, and you make that by going from the ischial tuberosities up to the pubic synthesis. And then the posterior triangle is called the anal triangle, and you go from the ischial tuberosities down to the coccyx to make that one. Deep, deeply, when th you're thinking about the perine perineum, you can you can think about it as uh, what comes after the pelvic floor or diaphragm. So, or what's deep to the deeper inferior to the pelvic floor and diaphragm. So you have the abdominal cavity, you have the pelvic cavity, then you have the uh, border of the pelvic cavity, which is made up of the pelvic floor. And so there's two muscles that contribute to the pelvic floor uh, primarily, and those are the levator ani and the coccygeus muscles shown here in this picture. So when you g now that you've seen where the pelvic floor is, you can imagine that um, deep to that you have the you have the you have the perineum. There's two pouches of the perineum and it's divided into these pouches because of the fascia layers that that cover the structures in the perineum. But for us what's important is the superficial pouch of the perineum and three uh, muscles within it and also the perineal body. So Let's talk about these muscles and show them on the, the picture. So we have the superficial transverse perineal muscle coming from the sides here. Then you have bulbospongiosis muscle here surrounding the vaginal orifice. Then you have the ischiocavernosus muscles going up here to the to the clitoris anteriorly. So the each each of these muscles um, has has some function. It's, they're not super super important, but but they do, but they do make some contributions. So you have ischiocavernosus, which helps um, with clitoral erection. You have bulbospongiosis, which helps reduce the opening of the vaginal or orifice, and also when it um, contracts, it, it compresses the dorsal clitoral vein, um, contributing some to erection. And then you have the transverse perineal muscles, which are important because they hold the perineal body in place in the center. The perineal body itself is is um, a fibrous tissue that also gets uh, muscular contributions from the superficial transverse perineal coming from the side, from bulbospongiosis coming from uh, the top and the external anal sphincter uh, beneath it. The innervation and, and blood supply here are kind of easy to remember because they both come from the pudendal. You have the pudendal nerve, which remember courses um, out of the greater sciatic foramen and back in through the lesser sciatic foramen and it gets contributions from S2 and S4, part of the sacral plexus. And uh, the clinical correlate that's good to know about is the pudendal um, nerve block. So the key landmark that you that you want to find if you're doing a pudendal nerve block is the ischial spine. And the point of doing a pudendal nerve block is to, to block sensation to this area to relieve some of the pain um, with, with childbirth. So the pudendal nerve supplies uh, the muscles in the perineum and also supplies the skin and superficial tissue of the perineum. So the the blood supply comes from the pudendal artery. I'm just tracing that off the aorta. You have the aorta coming down, dividing up into the common iliacs. Common iliacs divide up into the internal and external iliacs. External iliac goes on uh, to become the femoral artery after the inguinal ligament. And the internal iliac divides into its anterior and posterior division. The anterior division gives off some important things, which if you've been watching these, uh, you've already learned about um, the uterine artery coming off of that division, but it also um, it also gives rise to the pudendal artery, and the pudendal artery is sort of like the terminal uh, branch of the the internal iliac artery. And remember that it's the anterior branch that it comes off of. And so the there's some branches of the pudendal artery that are that are good to know about. So the inferior rectal artery comes off of the pudendal artery. Now the clitoral branches come off of the come off of the, the inferior pudendal artery, and also the perineal artery comes off of that. So now we'll move on to uh, the point of this talk, which is talk about um, laceration repairs. So the first thing to do is to grade the laceration to see how bad it is um, before you decide on how you're going to repair it. So there's four different degrees of laceration. Uh, the first one is just uh, vaginal mucosa or perineal skin. So that's shown here in, in um, the white on this picture. Second, you to sort of define these, you're always building on the one behind it. So that's the first degree laceration. The second degree laceration, you you have um, vaginal mucosa or perineal skin laceration. You add on to that um, laceration of perineal muscle uh, or and the perineal body, and so that's shown here in the red. If it extends, if it extends into the red, then it's a second degree 
uh, laceration. A third degree laceration it includes what's what's in a second degree laceration and involves and it adds on involvement of the anal sphincter shown here in the red and the blue. And a fourth degree laceration is a third degree laceration plus involvement of the rectal mucosa. So you have complete transection of the sphincter and also involvement of the rectal mucosa. And the rectal mucosa is shown here in, in black. So those are the, the four stages of the lacerations. And then how to how to repair it will be based on um, what you're starting what you're starting with. And uh, a, a note is that you should do a rectal exam first to make sure that there's not a posterior tear that you're not um, that you're not easily able to see. So if you have a if you have a first degree laceration, you can repair that just like you would repair um, like any other cut. You just use interrupted sutures. You reapproximate the skin, and, and you're done. But a, a second degree laceration involves um, you need to use a two step repair, and this is sort of the foundation thing to remember for how to repair these because third and fourth degree lacerations are, are sort of add-ons to this procedure. So if you have a second degree tear, this two-step process, the first step um, is you start out at the apex of the tear, so I'll just draw a tear here. So you start at the apex of it, which is the the most the innermost part of the of the tear through the vaginal mucosa. You put an anchoring suture, then you re reapproximate re the vaginal mucosa using running sutures going down and then once once you've done that then you move on to the perineal body and you need to reapproximate that and remember that you're doing this um, deep in the in the perineal body you're not like going through the skin and bringing that together that's what the second the second stage of the repair is for so the second stage of the repair is after you've after you've brought the mucosa back together you've brought um, the perineal body the deep deep bites of the perineal body back together then you have to bring um, the perineal skin back together and you do this using a subcuticular suture suturing to, uh, to bring the skin back together and you start typically at the bottom so I'll just I'll draw again so we have our anchoring suture we have the laceration we've sewn it back together that's vaginal mucosa that's perineal body but then the skin we haven't sewn that back together so you need to use subcuticular suturing to bring the skin together like like so and then the, these pictures here will, will show it a little bit better so here's the tear anchoring suture, we're going to sew the mucosa back together, we're going to sew the perineal body back together. That's step one, and then this is supposed to be what it's going to look like after you finish step one. So you've got you've got the, the, the deep layer of the perineal body sewed together, and then you, you need to bring the, reapproximate the skin using subcuticular sutures. So we'll just draw what that would look like here. So your initial suturing sewed together the perineal body, so that's already been brought together. But now you bring the skin together by taking bites just below the skin and, and reapproximating. And so you'd start here. The ape, you'd start here down at the apex, bring the skin back up together, and then and that would be how you'd um, do the two-step repair of a second-degree laceration. And so third and fourth degree tears. You do you basically do something, and then you and then you proceed to how you how you would repair a second-degree tear. So a third-degree tear, what you need to do. I guess what distinguishes a, a third degree tear from a second degree tear? A third degree tear includes involvement of the anal sphincter, so that would be a tear here. So what you what you need to do first is sew the anal sphincter back together. You can just do that using interrupted sutures, and then you'd proceed just as you would with a second degree tear, bringing the mucosa perineal body back together, and then uh, closing the the skin with subcuticular sutures. If you have a fourth degree tear, then you need to repair initially the rectal mucosa, then the sphincter. Then the, then proceed as you would with a with a second degree tear. So are there ways to prevent this? There there are, and the big one to know about is that you want to try to avoid operative deliveries and also avoid using episiotomies. That's the best way to prevent um, third and fourth degree tears. And the the reason that you want to prevent these and why the why they can be a big deal and cause lots of um, morbidity for your patients are that they, they lead to um, anal incontinence. They can have they can dehis, have dehiscence. They can have um, infections perineal abscess that can cause fist fistulas. As you can imagine, it'd be easy to imagine how a rectovaginal fistu fistula or rectocutaneous fistula could form um, after suffering something like this. And then finally, we'll just go finish up like we do with um, the questions. So let's go over the stages. What's stage one? That's just laceration of the mucosa or, or perineal skin. Stage two, that's stage one plus involvement of the perineal body. Stage three, you add on involvement of the of the anal sphincter stage four, you add on involvement of the of the rectal mucosa, and so the way to repair this is you start out by remembering that two-step repair for a second degree. You bring the 
vaginal mucosa back together, you bring the perineal body back together, and then you've, you, that's, that's step one, and then step two is um, reapproximating the skin. So we, if we remember that, then we, then we can think about how, to, how you do a stage, stage three repair, is you just start out by sewing the um, anal sphincter back together, and then, do, and then do it like you would with the stage two, and then the stage four, you need to sew the rectal mucosa back together, and the, the um, anal sphincter, sphincter back together, and then proceed like a, like a stage two. And so how do you prevent this? Like we said, operative delivery and episiotomy, if you can avoid those, that's great because it helps prevent third and fourth degree tears. The complications, the big one to remember is the anal incontinence. There's also fistula formation, infection, dehiscence, um, pain with intercourse, uh, among others. And then a question you could ask if someone, if, if you saw a patient who had maybe a fourth degree laceration or a third degree one, would you recommend that they have a C-section or um, try again with vaginal delivery? And that's the perineal laceration talk.